Now, species interactions. So, interactions can be food supply. So, some examples, which may or may not be pictured, would be, say, bone worms. What does this look like? Well, this looks like some manner of bone. So, let's bold this, or underline it. Bone worms feed on the bones of dead whales. Whale falls are quite an important part of deep sea food supplies. First, you have a mass of various eels and other uh, similar predators, or scavengers rather, in this case, that bore into the body and eat up all the meat. And then you have the bone worms that feed on the bones. They drill into them to get at the marrow and they disperse their young on routes where whales commonly migrate. You can have a whale fall every few miles or every uh, few kilometers even. This is close enough for young bone worms to make the trip or bone worm larvae rather. Photosynthetic microorganisms live inside giant clams and corals, corals by the way are not plants or fungi or whatever, they are animals. They are basically tiny sea anemones if you look at them closely. So where, whereas say jellyfish are a medusa form, corals often include their polyp forms which essentially act like an upside down medusa except rather planted in place. So something like this. Of course there are a number of tentacles, but you get the point. So it's like an upside down jellyfish almost. Please note that jellyfishes are not fish. Thanks. So, corals, coral bleaching is so dangerous because under sufficient stress, corals will eject their algae from where they live, usually between the layers of the coral's own cells. This reduces their food supply because the photosynthesis that these microorganisms, usually single-celled algae, supply them with a steady stream of food, whereas ejecting them leaves the coral uh, without said steady stream of food. Hence why coral bleaching is, while recoverable, often a uh, sign of an impending die-off if the corals cannot get enough food without the algae helping them. Other interactions between species may be protection. Now, many species depend on others for shelter and protection. So we have stuff like hermit crabs, which uses shells of dead snails, or nowadays even plastic bottle caps, for protective homes. We also have ants that live within the trunks of cecropia trees, or acacia trees, depending on the case. These trees provide shelter for the ants, and the ants protect the trees by attacking whatever tries to attack the trees, be it, say, an herbivore, or, well, a smaller herbivore. So, say, deer or people try to touch the tree, yet the ants are going to get on them and bite them, which, of course, is unpleasant. Now, if a caterpillar gets on the tree, the ants, depending on the specific symbiotic relationship and the species involved of ants and trees, they may eat the caterpillar, or they might just throw it off which happens with certain species of acacia ants. Now, what else can we think of in terms of protection? I'm not writing livestock here for very good reason. You can probably guess what that reason is. 
because, well, it's not just livestock that humans protect. Agriculture, in and of itself, is essentially a symbiosis where we take care of an organism, we uh, attack pests that we don't want, because there are no such thing as pests in nature. Pests are entirely an artificial concept. We attack things that attack these organisms that we want, and, well, we even help them spread their offspring to the point where corn is no longer capable of spreading its own offspring. Transportation, well, okay. Transportation can be of the organism, such as uh, various limpets or other crustaceans growing on whales, or it can be transportation of young organisms. So larval dispersion, pretty much. Now, this is something humans also do for our domesticated life forms. And other examples are flower mites climbing onto the bills of hummingbirds to get from one flower to another. Other seeds may have hooks, so commonly we call these burrs, B-U-R-R, burr, as singular, that allow them to stick to passing animals. This is kind of hard to remove. So it might take quite a bit of scratching to get it off of the fur where it's tangled in with the tiny hooks. So after the dog finally gets these bars off, they may be quite a distance from the parent plant. Now in other cases, these burrs, instead of merely being hooked, happen to be sharp instead. So they stab into the flesh of an organism. The organism dislodges the uncomfortable object and, well, it usually ends up discarding the thing that attacked it. Once it recognizes that biting it will not be helpful, uh, as is an instinct for many organisms when prodded painfully. Now, other species may, rea may rely on other various species for their own successful reproduction. For example, fruit. The whole reason of a fruit existing is to draw animals to eat that fruit, either swallow the seeds or spit them out. And guess what happens when the seed gets spat out or swallowed? It either lands away from the parent or spends a while and then lands away from the parent usually quite a distance away, too. What other examples can we think of besides these illustrations? For example, uh, abandoned tree cavities by woodpeckers being used by other birds. Well, this also goes into agriculture. Of course, this uh, hygiene also uh, has agriculture as one of its examples, and so does digestion, actually. Why? Well, there's a reason why four-field crop rotation happened to be such a big deal in increasing food production in medieval Europe. And that's because it increased the amount of fertilizers in the soil, which in a sense can be considered to be a improving the digestion of the plants, or the nutrient uptake at least. But that's a bit of an indirect example compared to the ones mentioned here. So termites and other animals that eat cellulose, they don't digest the cellulose themselves necessarily, although there is some evidence that certain silverfish species can. They rely on symbionts, which are bacteria or protists. Protists are eukaryotes, bacteria are prokaryotes. Now, in the large intestines of humans, certain vitamins are produced by bacteria and absorbed by our large intestines walls. Now, in other animals, the large intestines walls can be used for 
absorbing other nutrients, such as, well, horses, unlike, say, cows, have hindgut fermentation. This means that it is in the large intestine that cellulose is broken down by symbiotic bacteria. So those give off volatile fatty acids such as propionic acid, which are then absorbed by the walls of the intestine and thus put to use by the horse. Now for hygiene, some species help maintain the health of another species. In fact, humans also experience this with our large intestine flora. Uh, there are certain infections and inflammations of the large intestine where the traditional treatment is literally to eat crap. Um, unfortunately, the modern version of fecal inoculation is considerably more palatable and uh, it's a, basically a matter of introducing the large intestine flora of a healthy person into the patient and letting it outcompete the flora that is harming the patient because in a sense these organisms are also invested in the patient's health and are evolutionarily, over long-term evolutionary pressures, adapted toward helping, the helping their host as much as they can, within reason. After all, it is through their hosts that these bacteria essentially propagate from generation to generation of hosts. Because, well, it's not just the mites that live in one's sweat pores and sweat skin glands that happen to uh, propagate from generation to generation along a mostly maternal lineage. Why mostly maternal? Well, babies have no, none of these skin mites. Adults do, and guess which adults are in most, the most contact with babies? Yeah, I think it's obvious. So, hygiene. Other examples include coral reef cleaning stations where large fish come to get their teeth or oral cavities in general or even gill rakers cleaned by small fish and shrimp which will eat the parasites. Now the bacteria that lives on us also helps us not just in the large intestine, but in the skin in general, in fending off infections. Now, human actions have been not so good for biodiversity. With the rate of loss of species that, for the most part, have never been catalogued, we are losing potential food supplies, so potential species that could be used as food supply. There are many, 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 many possible staple foods in the world. Only a few see large-scale use. This is inefficient. Now, we are also losing many potential medicines or reducing the sources of existing identified medicines. Since most of the life on Earth has not ever been cataloged by biologists, there are no doubt many other potential cures for various diseases such as can certain cancers that are out there but just haven't been encountered yet. Many of them never will be encountered due to human greed uh, eliminating the rainforests and other environments that they might happen to be living in. Tourism and forestry are other problems that cutting down rainforests or cutting down particular uh, old growth forests or filling in swamps and so on are not so good for. Admittedly, in a few cases, filling in swamps may actually be a good idea in terms of reducing the mosquito populations or the flies, but those can be controlled by, say, fish. Or, if you can keep the water quality high, stuff like mayflies. Mayfly larvae are good at killing these things, dipterans. Dipterans are also prime food for dragonflies and dragonfly larvae. 
which also require relatively good uh, water conditions. But they make it fine in swamps, even though we think of swamps as cleaning up water, so to speak, before it flows further down rivers. I'm pretty sure we have previously seen uh, certain shows that have demonstrated how swamps help keep rivers cleaner. And of course, our flood buffers. Now, what else? Well, okay, tourism is kind of hard when you have reg semi-regular floods because you uh, filled in all the swamps. Forestry, well, if we continue to make areas warm compared to before, we get stuff like the mountain pine beetle moving north and destroying pine forests, which of course is a problem with forestry. Beyond that, we also have the biogeochemical cycles shifting. Biogeochemical cycles shifting are a big deal because they are a global impact. And as a result, who knows what's going to happen locally? Well, okay, admittedly these can be predicted to a reasonable degree of accuracy. But in general, it's a lot of unpleasant stuff that the locals aren't used to and therefore mostly are not adapted to, whether it be behaviorally for the animals, evolutionarily, i.e. the genetic frequencies over the long run, or do they have the genetic diversity to withstand these changes? We don't know. And it tends, changes also tend to reduce genetic uh, diversity. Just not necessarily even just because of the bottleneck effect where, oh, the sample that we get is small compared to the original pool of diversity and now we have to reestablish the population with only a few, say, northern elephant seals or whatever other species. Now, in summary, the biological species concept defines species as all individuals that are able to freely breed under natural circumstances and which do not suffer hybrid breakdown within a few generations as uh, certain species of rice do. Now, a population is a group of individuals that does this. Now, these can, in some cases, be the same. So, a species only has one population, or a species can have many, many populations that experience relatively rare gene flow, such as humans before modern travel technologies. Well, many villages, or towns even, were quite isolated. So, they were basically separate populations. Biologists have identified and described more than 1.7 million species, probably more like 2 million or so now. And there's an estimated anywhere from 10 million to, well, billions of species on Earth. Admittedly, some of these species are a little bit hard to deal with, such as, say, bacteria or certain fungi that have no identified sexual stage. Uh, but for the most part, we use the biological species concept instead of, say, morphological or biochemical. All species depend on other species in a variety of ways for their own survival. Even aggressive pathogenic variations of, say, E. coli, Escherichia coli, uh, which is one of the most common large intestine bacteria. Even pathogenic varieties depend on other species for their own survival because if they didn't attack the intestinal wall, well, where would they get their resources? Yeah, um, the others that aren't pathogenic get along just fine. But apparently some strains pick up various genes that make it so that it's more favorable to attack the intestinal wall. We do point out that the uh, genetic divergence between strains of E. coli can be considerably greater than the genetic differences between a human and a platypus. So E. coli is essentially a morphological species, if that, because they can pick up genes for, say, extra flagella or something. Species evolve over time and over space. 
Often, space is required so that isolation of populations can occur, and then they accumulate differences from one another until when the barrier is removed, they don't recognize each other or something similar. Uh, although sometimes you don't even need a barrier and this still ends up isolating into two populations. For example, bottom feeders on a lake and surface feeders. Regardless, time and space are generally both required. Biodiversity refers to the variety of species in an ecosystem, but it also includes structural diversity within ecosystems. So in other words, how different are various parts of the terrain? How many niches, such as, oh, canopy nesting birds, understory nesting birds, ground nesting birds, and so on, are there? There is also a matter of individual variability within species. Now, these variations, of course, are mostly genetic because, well, genetic variations are definitely inherited to offspring. Unlike, say, behavioral adaptations or cultural adaptations, which generally must be learned, and we know that in many species there is little to no parenting. Now, new species are still being discovered, but Many never will be due to the fact that human activities are destroying large areas of biologically diverse lands, or at least ecosystems, because the land is still there afterwards. So that's it for this section, this introduction on biodiversity, and we'll see each other again then next section. <laughs>